which of our current space travel methods are the fastest? Is it better to spend a week in orbit or on the moon? What would happen if we nuked the moon? And in Q&A Plus, which animal would handle zero gravity the best? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are, across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Brennan O'Donnell, what are the fastest current methods for travel? So there's different propulsion systems that we currently use that have different advantages. So the traditional chemical rocket system can give you very high acceleration. It can take you from zero to very fast in just a few minutes of time, but then it's over. You know, you have to have hundreds of thousands of tons of fuel in some cases, a million tons of fuel, like a lot of fuel. And it's gone in just a short period of time because you are burning this stuff up. It is blasting hot gases out of the back of the rocket and away you go. Now, the method that we have that would allow a spacecraft to reach its highest speed is probably an ion drive. So in this case, you have a magnetic field and you are accelerating ions out the back of that field. So something like xenon or krypton, and you can accelerate them at hundreds of kilometers per second and that can raise the velocity of your spacecraft. Now it takes a long time to speed up your spacecraft. You know, the amount of force that the spacecraft receives is kind of like, you know, hold a piece of paper on your hand. That's the amount of force, you know, the, the gravitational force pulling down a piece of paper, that is not very much. And yet you just keep that on, keep that going for months, even years, and it will provide a huge amount of change in your velocity. So it's very efficient, but it's not very powerful. And that's it. The, like, those are the two methods. I mean, the third method that's being like maybe kind of tested out right now are solar sails. But really, we're just in the initial testing stages of solar sails. So that's it. You've got chemical rockets, you've got ion engines. Those are the only two practical propulsion methods that anybody's used. Now, I, you know, I could rattle off a list of another dozen ideas for potential future propulsion systems. But right now, all we have are chemical rockets and ion engines. True crony, does the lunar Earth system have enough mass to create tidal flexing friction heat as Jupiter and its moons do? Hmm, I don't know what, like how much heat is deposited into the Earth or the moon through the tidal interactions. And I wonder if it requires multiple moons. Is it Jupiter and Io? Or is it the interaction between Jupiter, Io and Europa? Like clearly, we don't have volcanoes across the Earth, thanks to the tidal flexing. But that said, you know, when the moon is directly overhead, the ground is lifting up by a couple of meters that you are literally being pulled towards the moon, the surface of the Earth. Uh, and there's this like ripple of, of material that is being pulled up as the moon is orbiting around and a little bit because of the sun, but doesn't appear to be enough to like cause volcanoes on either the Earth or the moon. Rusty, thinking of moon mining and exploration, what would a Tsar Bomba do to the moon? So the Tsar Bomba, that was a sort of giant uh, thermonuclear weapon designed by the Soviets. I think it was only tested once. What was it? 20 megatons? Um, which was a lot, but the moon is hit by asteroids all the time. And they do more than 20 megatons of energy when they hit the surface of the moon. So I don't know exactly like I could probably do the math and come up with the size of the asteroid that would hit the moon and do 20 release 20 megatons of energy, but it's not very big. So, uh, you know, because they're going very fast. So this kind of thing happens on the moon on a regular basis. Like you would see this little flash, this little part that was like a little bit bright, and then it would fade away. Robert Gavir, which would be easier to make habitable for humans, Mars or Venus? Ugh, they both suck. So if you wanted to make Mars habitable, you would release a bunch of chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere of Mars, which would raise the temperature that would eventually melt the carbon dioxide trapped in the poles, which would thicken the atmosphere that would raise the temperature a little bit more Then you would melt all of the water at the poles of Mars. 
and whatever's trapped underneath the regolith. And so you would have a blue Mars. And then, you know, the conditions would probably be to the point that you could uh, put very hardy life cyanobacteria, things like that onto Mars, and you would be able to uh, start to have life growing. And maybe after about 10,000 years, you would have a thick enough atmosphere to be able to breathe on Mars, maybe. So uh, that would be the, the way to go down Mars, but it would still be like really cold. It would be like the dry deserts of Antarctica uh, on its best day. Venus is even harder, you would have to block all of the sunlight falling on Venus, then the planet would cool down, uh, its carbon dioxide atmosphere would would freeze out and fall like snow into this these layers kilometers deep. And then you would need to deposit some kind of material onto the surface of Venus that would then lock up all of that carbon. So, um, you know, we think about limestone, limestone, calcium carbonates, you need calcium, or maybe magnesium. So you would need to find a couple of asteroids, you know, an asteroid with a lot of magnesium in it, you have to grind it up and release that material down onto the surface of Venus, lock up all of that carbon dioxide, and then remove your shade and heat, let the planet warm up again. But now it doesn't have like as thick an atmosphere as it did before. And so that would get you like a more habitable planet. I think in the end, like if you get to pick one, I would pick Venus every time because it has the same gravity as Earth. And that's a big deal, because then it can hold on to its atmosphere. It receives a lot more sunlight than the Earth does. And so your solar panels would be more effective on Venus than they are even on Earth. So I think if you had to pick one, I'd pick Venus. But that's also mega engineering, way beyond our ability. It's time to shout out our new patrons of the $5 level and above. Gary Morse, Laurentio Pais, Thurston Howell III, Glenn Leber, Nick Waslin, Brian Lee Johnson, Robbie the Dog with the Dot, Greg LPSF, Greg, and Magical Thinker. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Tommy's Woodpile Adventures and Tall Tales. <laughs> Love your name. Do we have a Voyager type mission to interstellar space today? Yeah, we have the Voyagers. So the Voyagers are still moving out through the cosmos. And you know, even though it takes 24 hours for their signals to get back home, you know, they have left one portion of the solar system, they're now outside of the heliosphere, and they're now in the sort of combined solar wind of interstellar space. So yeah, I think a Voyager like mission that qualifies for what you're talking about are the Voyagers. Now, are there any plans to build any more missions? And so the answer is maybe um, NASA is working on a mission concept called the interstellar probe. And so this would be a mission that would fly out into interstellar space. And by that we just mean like outside of the heliosphere, like where the solar wind dominates and into the sort of interstellar regions where the solar wind but have the right instruments, you know, the voyagers were designed to do flybys of really of Jupiter and Saturn. And then they realized they could also add Uranus and Neptune for Voyager two. But this would be a spacecraft that maybe doesn't have cameras on board, it would just fly really quickly out into interstellar space and then would just start to sample the, the solar wind from other stars because these are other stars that are sending material towards us. And so if we just go out there and we collect it, measure the magnetic fields and measure the composition of that, we could learn a lot about other stars and just about the composition of the Milky Way entirely. Todd Ablett, would you rather spend a week in orbit or a week on the moon, assuming both are safe enough for commercial travel? Oh, I would want to spend a week on the moon. That would be very cool. Yeah, yeah, if I had to choose like being in orbit would be really amazing. Briefly, you'd be like, I'm in orbit. Look at that. I'm looking at the world. This is incredible. I'm in space. And you look out the window. This is great. And then you know, then you see the same like this again. But on the moon, it's a totally alien landscape. And you can walk around and explore, you can pick up rocks, you can jump around in the one third gravity. Yeah, if I had to pick one, I would prefer uh, going to the moon. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free, we call it Q&A plus. And this week's bonus question, which animal would handle zero gravity the best? And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had in this episode. Thank you everyone who joined me for the live show, everybody who put your questions into the YouTube comments. We are back and we've already recorded one of our live shows. The next one is going to be on Monday, December 22nd at 8 a.m. Pacific. But there's an event here on the channel that you can use to go in and subscribe and you'll get notified when that's going to be going live. 
I'm going to be talking about how you can support journalism. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Bear Lake Roofing, Brian Bodu, Caradwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Cy Nelson, Dark Finger, Dave Veriboff, David Giltonen, David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Switz, Michael Purcell, Nord Space, One Step for Animals.org, Paul Robach, Rank Heidi, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fallon Munley, Team 49, Telescopes Canada, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us, the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. Sort of very weird stage in the life cycle of journalism as an institution uh, where people are writing and reporting on the things that are happening in the world. Uh, we've got a lot of media consolidation. We've got a lot of companies that have gone under after their media consolidation because it turns out it's not a great business model. Um, we've got private equity firms that are offering to invest in various companies, YouTubers, a lot of uh, science communicators on YouTube have been invested in by various private equity firms. I have received a bunch of these emails, I have deleted them. Um, but, uh, you know, it's definitely, you know, it's getting harder and harder to make your way in this world. And a thing that I've noticed as a person who hires journalists is I've been getting a lot of inquiries from journalists on whether or not I've got any writing work for them. Um, and, you know, like names I would really like to have on the masthead of Universe Today. So I can definitely feel that there is this shift that is happening. Now, thanks to the patrons, we are 100% supported by Patreon. So as long as I don't get crazy with the money and hire a lot of really fantastic journalists to put on the masthead of Universe Today, we will be here for the long run because, you know, we are supported by all of the individuals. But a lot of other content creators and a lot of other like actual journalists are not so lucky. They are just under the whims. But a lot of them are starting Substacks. A lot of them are starting podcasts, their own blogs. We're getting this return of blogging and where a journalist who cut their teeth on something that is relevant and good is now able to make a living just by continuing to do their reporting, but doing it for themselves, doing it by themselves. So this is a plea. This is a recommendation to say, if there is someone out there who is writing on a topic that you really enjoy, they're doing a good job, and you think that they are shining a light into the places of darkness, that they are doing important work that is making our society better, try to support them, right? Like, like in general, the, mo the financial models have been figured out. You know, they have an email mailing list, they have a podcast, they have a video, whatever, um, and support them directly. And, and you will make sure that they can be around for a long, long time. Because uh, I think this is the model that's working very well that don't try to be part of a giant news organization like the New York Times, or the Washington Post or CNN or any of that, that in fact, if you're a if you're good at your job, you can be funded directly by the by the people who are reading your news and you don't have to be funded by very many of them, a couple of 1000 people, and you have all of your expenses paid for and you can do that work forever. So and they're and often a lot of them are not that expensive, you know, a couple of dollars here, $5 there, uh, to be able to support them and suddenly you give these people a career. And so if you're getting email newsletters on a regular basis, if there are people who are doing a good job, support them directly if you can. Of course, you could support us on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash universe today. But, but like just in general, you're going to see the voices who can't support themselves wink out and go find other jobs. And that's going to suck for our ability to get an accurate understanding of what's happening in the world and in the universe. All right, we'll see you next time.